Will the Old Testament believers go into rapture? Does and evil I... always exist? Am I real saved? Do I really have the Holy Spirit within me? How did the early Christians believe what was true and what, what is was the not? the second death? People who say they are a prophet. Where do you draw the line between defending yourself and turning the other cheek like Christ said? This is Pastor's Perspective. We're here every Monday through Friday providing answers on a variety of topics, including the Bible, end times, other religions, and the family. Call right now with your question at 1-888-564-6173. That's 888-564-6173. You can also post your question at facebook.com slash pastor's perspective. Answering your questions today is author and apologist Don Stewart. Also on today's panel is Bill Welsh, Senior Pastor at Refuge Calvary Chapel in Huntington Beach, California. And now here's today's host, Brian Perez. Welcome once again to another edition of Pastor's Perspective. We are here live in the studio on this Thursday afternoon. We're here for two hours today, in fact, to take your calls on the Bible or the Christian faith. The first hour is live. The second hour we're going to record and play back at a later date. Thank you so much for listening today. And uh, give me or let me give you the phone number once again. It's 888-564-6173, 888-564-6173. Pastor's Perspective is sponsored by California Baptist University Online and Professional Studies, CBU Online, Live Your Purpose. With me today, Don Stewart of EducatingOurWorld.com and Bill Welsh. He's sitting in for Pastor Brian Broderson. Pastor Bill is from Refuge Calvary Chapel in Huntington Beach here in Southern California. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, hello. What's up? What's new? Hello. We well, just finished the uh, the pastor's conference here, the uh, Calvary Global Network uh, uh, pastor's conference. What a great, great mm, conference. Mm. And just especially, I, I you know, there's something about closing with communion that is just, what well, it's, it's that, uh, you know, obviously in many... Uh, denominations. It's that sacrament. It's that moment, that reminder where you remember what it is that binds you together. It's the body and the blood of Jesus offered on our behalf. But it was just a really powerful uh, time together mm -hmm. and uh, just great speakers, great worship, and wonderful time. So guys from all over the world. I think I think Brian said there were, I don't know, 17, 18 different countries represented. This wow. Time. Yeah. Uh, some of my old friends from out in, in West Australia were here and and some from over in Sydney, and yeah, it was a great time. That must be neat to see people that you only see every few years. I mean, in that kind of a setting where you haven't seen, seen each other maybe in several years, and yeah. then all of a sudden there you are on the campus yeah. here to... Uh, Starting where you yeah. left off and, yeah. and just hearing what uh, God's doing in their fellowships. And, and then they're not all pastors. A lot of them are involved in uh, some parachurch ministries, mm -hmm. as they say, you know, and, and just, you know, farming the land. That's... The the uh, the thought that really came to my mind, I was with uh, Pastor Brian uh, Broderson and uh, Nate Holdridge from up at Calvary Chapel up in uh, in Monterey, and we were doing a uh, a workshop together on uh, ministry methodology and cultural adaptation. You know, you you one size fits all when it comes to the gospel. There's there's not twenty different gospels. One size fits all, but you have to adapt to the culture that you live in. And what really struck me is that we are farmers. Uh, I, I could sing the farmer's jingle right there. We are farmers, but but we're all just planting seed, aren't we, Don? I mean, we yes. have that beautiful seed of the gospel and uh, the wonderful word of God. Scripture says in Psalm 100, the last verse, I think is verse 6, that his truth endures to all generations. We don't have to change a thing about it. Just keep planting the seed, cultivating, harvesting, and processing, you know? Yeah. And uh, it, we have a very clear mission, which is what this program is all about, too. That's right. 888 the telephone number. You can also post your question on the Pastor's Perspective Facebook page, but we so prefer to listen to the sound of your voice, so give us a call, 888 Anything happening in the news? I know there's, there was another shooting today, this one in uh, Maryland yeah. uh, at a newspaper office, I believe. Mm -hmm. Five people dead, suspect yeah. in custody, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's all we got it now. It happened a few hours ago, Capital Gazette in Annapolis, Maryland. Another, you know, shooting in a um, business setting. Um, I guess a person had a shotgun shot his way through the glass and yeah. killed people. I I don't know if they've had anything uh, about why, what was the motivation, you know, whether it was a domestic thing, whether it was something to do with the newspaper, something mm -hmm. he said. She always something along yeah. that line usually. So remember the listening to the news earlier today and the. 
had come to the conclusion, you know, the situation over in Long Beach where mm -hmm. um, an officer, or a, not an officer, a fireman was killed. Mm -hmm. and they said the motivation was that the man was angry at his neighbor upstairs. So he, he set off an explosion mm. to kill his neighbor upstairs and hopefully, hopefully kill him himself. Yeah. And I said, Don, do you see, that, do you think there's more uh, yeah. of this or are we just more connected to hear about more of it? <sighs> Well, that's a good question. It's the world. See, violence is one of the signs. Then, mm -hmm. remember, Jesus said, "As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man." And in Genesis six, I believe it's verse eleven, Hamas—that's the Hebrew word for violence—filled the earth. And so, um, the idea that uh, we live in a violent world, lawlessness and violence—the yeah. two go together. And those are two of the signs of the end. And we see it, and we will continue to see it more and more. And and uh, it seems the world is getting somewhat immune to it, too. The story, it's like, oh, here comes another you know, yeah. mass killing. And that's mm -hmm. like, yeah. it doesn't, it, yeah, it's sad, isn't it? It really is. 888-564-6173. We're going to start with a couple of Facebook questions. Here's one sent in uh, from somebody who prefers to remain anonymous. So, yes, you can do that. Uh, this person writes, I know you guys say that soul sleep is not biblical, and you always refer to 2 Corinthians 5.8, Philippians 1.23, Acts 7.59. So how do you reconcile those passages passages with Acts 2, 29 through 34, John 11, 11, and John 14, 3? The reason I'm asking is because I heard a preacher say very adamantly, stop saying when we die, we go to heaven. We are not going up until the dead go up. We are all going up together. When I heard this, I was so sick to my stomach. It does not seem very hopeful being a Christian and then sleeping until the dead are raised first. I don't want to be in the presence of Jesus when I, I, wait, I don't want to wait to be in the presence of Jesus when I die. Where is the blessing in that? If Paul and Stephen knew that their spirits would be with Jesus when they died, how did they know that? Don? Well, how do they know it? Uh, through divine revelation. Uh, after death is, you know, one death and the judgment. We've got, there's five places in the New Testament that talk about being absent from the body, then being present with the Lord. And, uh, you know, you've got those. And soul sleep is not a biblical doctrine. In my book, What Happens One Second After We Die, we talk about that. Uh, it's called soul sleep or soul regeneration. In other words, once you die, you cease to exist, then your soul is regenerated at the time of the resurrection of the dead. But that doesn't square real, very well with what Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, you'd still be sleeping away after 2,000 years, you know. So um, uh, the idea is we're in the immediate presence of Christ. And here's the thing, Stephen. Uh, had the Lord Jesus welcome him to the, you know, when he he died, you know, uh, welcome him into heaven. Enoch and Elijah went up to heaven. They didn't die, but they went there. Now, heaven isn't just with Enoch, Elijah, and Stephen. There aren't the only three there. Everybody else is asleep. And so uh, the idea of soul sleep or soul regeneration is not biblical. The passages that uh, are, are quoted have nothing to do with that. The body sometimes is, is said to be sleeping, and meaning it's inactive, as it were, but it's, it's a metaphor for not, you know, uh, a person's dead in the sense their body's not working and moving just like sleep, but they're going to awake someday, and that's the resurrection of the dead. But the spirit goes to be with the Lord, the body stays in the grave. So it's unfortunate people teach that, and they, they take away a hope of people because the moment we die, we're in the presence of the Lord. That's right. Uh, that great observation there, Don, about Stephen, <laughs> that Jesus didn't hand Stephen a pillow when no, he saw him. No, no, he yeah. He's, yeah, him. no. Yeah, he's received my spirit. Yes. He's right there. You yes. know, he's going to go, the, you know, he's, he's received there, so... Yeah. Uh, another question about same subject, basically, death um, sent in by Andrew. Andrew says, my wife and girls have a fear of dying. They believe in Jesus, but if you bring up dying, they don't want to hear it. They go into a panic attack. The fear is that nothing will be waiting for them, that what if God isn't real? Bill? Well, I guess you get back to a discussion on the fact that we can trust what the Bible says. All of our answers, mm -hmm. you know, on, on this program have to be, obviously, just seated or, or um, founded in, in Scripture. And the Bible makes it so clear that there's a wonderful future waiting for those who love Christ. And Paul did say uh, that, you know, words, in, in his case, Greek words or English words, fail to describe what it will be. But it's anything but nothingness. There, it, there's n nothingness is not one of those things that's awaiting us in, in the mysteries that, that Paul spoke about. And when you look, oh my goodness, the, we just finished up the study through the book of Revelation. And those last couple of chapters that tell you both what will not be there and the beautiful scene that is laid out for us on 
on what heaven is going to look like and what eternity is going to look like. And a, a renewed, or new or renewed, there's debates on that, but the new heaven, the new earth. And if you, if you just want to take a, a look around at the most beautiful spots you've ever been to on earth or look them up online, you know, the paradises, whether they're in the jungle or in the forest, and tell your kids, honey, look at how glorious this is. The same God that made this is going to make a new earth for us that we will get to explore mm -hmm. for all of eternity. Yeah. So just take them back to the, the proof of what God made in this first creation and let them know he's got something even better for, for us in this uh, last creation. All right, Andrew, thank you for sending in your question on the Pastor's Perspective Facebook page. I'm Brian Perez, here with author and apologist Don Stewart of EducatingOurWorld.com, and Bill Welsh, pastor of Refuge Calvary Chapel in Huntington Beach here in Southern California. He's sitting in for Pastor Brian Broderson today. And to the phones we go, 888-564-6173. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, create uh, questions about the uh, beginning of time. And uh, here's our first one, Josh in Whittier. Hello, Josh. Hey, Hey. Hey. Um, God bless you guys. I've called before, but now I have another question. Okay. Um, you know how the Jesus? I, I don't remember what passage it was in, but Jesus said he saw Satan come down to earth like lightning. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how close was it? He created the earth. He created the earth, and then um, I guess Satan. He banished Satan down like lightning and how close was adam and eve to that i know the earth is around six thousand years old so it was only that long ago when he rebelled but i'm wondering how close it was because their rebellion uh when satan tempted eve was around you guys said like around a month or something like that i was just wondering all right uh, how close that was you know what i mean don yeah good questions josh okay um we're not told in scripture the exact timing of the fall of the being who became uh, Satan. Uh, you know, Satan means the adversary. Uh, the devil means the slander. He became this individual through his rebellion against God. He was an anointed cherub, the highest form of a created being. He decided to rebel. It seems that this happened before God created the heavens and the earth, uh, the present heavens and the earth. We know by Genesis 3, uh, you know, with Adam and Eve, there, that had already taken place because you have the tempter there tempting Adam and Eve to sin, which assumes some type of fall in somewhere in the universe, in the solar system, or in the universe, I should say, um, that um, would allow something like that, because if everything was still perfect, there wouldn't be a tempter there. So we know at least by the, uh, you know, the time Adam and Eve were there in the garden and given the commandments by God that this, per this personage had already fallen. Now, it was fairly soon, most likely, after they arrived there, because they were told to be fruitful and multiply, and they hadn't conceived or any children born yet, so, uh, and they were told to be fruitful and multiply right away, and they were created as fully mature adults. So seemingly this happened v very soon with respect to the fall of this being, most likely, it seems anyway, to have happened before uh, Genesis 1-1, God created the, you know, the heavens and the earth, which means the universe, and that, but uh, in this unseen realm, there was a, um, you know, these angelic beings, spiritual beings, supernatural beings, and this one was one of them. And part of the problem, Bill, isn't it, that we, we only have a general explanation of all that, because that's not the main story mm -hmm. of the Bible. Our yeah. curiosity is not solved by what it says, because it's really not germane to the story. You're right. We, we have everything that we need to know, like it says yeah. in, the, in the New Testament, is it one of Peter's epistles where he says we have everything pertaining to life, life and God. Exactly. Yeah. But we, we've all got unanswered questions. Oh, billions of them. I'd love to see your list of unanswered questions, Don. Oh, they're, <laughs> I they're, think yours is shorter than mine. There's so many of them. No, 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 so many of them. And, but that's okay, yeah. because it is. We, we, we have everything we need to know in Scripture. Mm -hmm. So, Josh, we know that the fall took place, you know, uh, at the beginning, uh, you know, uh, whether it was before the beginning of this created universe, uh, you know, we don't know, most likely it was. But then again, some people argue it didn't happen until Genesis chapter 3. Um, it seems that happened previous to that, but it, it happened in the very beginning, let's put it that way. Yeah. All right, Josh, thanks for your question today on Pastor's Perspective. Got a question here about uh, Cain and Abel from Scarlett in Massachusetts. Hello, Scarlett. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering who Cain got married to, if only Adam and Eve and Cain, like, were in the world and there was no other people. I was wondering how Cain got married. All right, Don. Yeah, uh, they weren't the only people, Scarlet, at that time. Cain and Abel were the two first two children of Adam and Eve. 
but there were many sons and daughters, we're told in Genesis chapter 5, that Adam and Eve had. We're also told this, when we get to the fifth chapter of Genesis, after Cain killed Abel, you have the birth of the son that was the replacement of the promised line named Seth. And it was 130 years of age that Adam was, and his wife Eve, of course, were when Seth was born. What does that mean? That means for 130 years, children were born, children born to children, this and that. You start doing the math, there could be tens of thousands of people there at that particular time whom they got married to. Now, it's interesting, though. Um, we're not told that Cain and Abel were married, are we, Bill? We, we, I mean, we assume that might have, there's no Mrs. Yeah, Cain or point, Mrs. No. Abel. You know, um, they were two of the people there. Um, well, Cain eventually took a wife, yeah, as yeah. it were, but uh, but after before that, after but that right. was afterwards, though. Right. Yeah, and so uh, he took a wife uh, after you know he killed Abel. He, but before that time, he didn't have one. Mm -hmm. Now, which is interesting there too. So, or uh, you know, there's so much we don't know there. All we know is yeah. he, he took a wife. Then uh, you and you can start you know letting your mind roll. Well, what's saying? Well, how can all and you know look. All we know is 130 years that's or so right. that we're there. And so, and that, that's another one of those uh, definitive answers that's lost in the creases of, of yeah. history. You know, that yeah. we, like you said, we don't know. You think of, of the age that we're given that the people live to be, by the way. And so you think of, well, if there's generations down and someone, let's say, from my generation is marrying someone that, let, let's say, would be in the generation of great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren, and you think, oh my gosh, that just sounds horrible. But when you're living to 500, 600 years, the time gap's not the same as a few yeah. years of, of age difference between a husband and wife here. But it's the, they, they all came from Adam and Eve. And so all the, all, we're all, we can all trace our lineage back to mom and dad in the garden. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of things, too, about the account because it just gets to the point that we don't know where it talks about Cain knew his wife. I guess you could possibly argue even Cain says, I'm going to be a wa homeless wanderer. Does that mean by himself? Maybe he had a wife before that. We, I mean, we just don't know. There's yeah. not, it's, we're not given su sufficient information. But what we do know is this, that uh, Adam lived 130 years and fathered another son in his likeness, and that was Seth to take the place of Abel. But the, the, if they had, well, they, he did not have a wife. If she, they had the wife before. We just don't know. With Abel, we're not even told if he right. had a wife or children or anything right. like that. There's no genealogy of Abel. Right. That's all we know. All right, Scarlett, does that help? Yeah, I have one more question. Okay. Why did God, why did God free the devil if he knew um, he would rebel? All right, Don. Yeah, well, he didn't actually. He created this perfect being that did rebel. Now, so the question obviously is, well, he knew he was going to rebel, so why did he create him knowing that sometime he would become the devil? Remember, he became the devil. Uh, Satan. Satan means the adversary. He became the devil. He became the slander. But he wasn't created that way. But so the question is, it's a great question. Why would God have created him if he knew what he would have known, if this would have happened? And the answer is, we are not told. We know that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Uh, the Bible says God uses the wrath of individuals to praise him. Someday th this uh, creature will get his deserved end. Mm -hmm. But uh, beyond that, I mean, again, we can speculate. Uh, I don't think, Bill, I, you know, my view is this. I want to go only as far as the Bible goes. Yes. Paul says don't go beyond that which is written because yes. you can do a lot of speculation, and it just doesn't do any good because we're yeah. not told. We're told what we need to know about the main truths of the whole biblical story and mm -hmm. that, but beyond that, you know, we can ask ourselves a lot of questions that we just can't get the answer to. That's true, and I think it's important to remember that even though uh, uh, Lucifer, fallen Lucifer, Satan, was involved in the temptation, pointing out the the tree that was beautiful mm -hmm. to look at and suggesting it might, you might want to put it on your on your diet. Um, it was Adam, it was Eve that sinned. It wasn't, they weren't judged, um, or, or Satan wasn't judged because of what he was involved with with Adam and Eve. They chose against the law of That's God, right. the the word of God, the commandments of God, to to violate His word. So yeah. they they were. Um, they had to, to face that before God on, on their own, and they were judged. And I guess you'd say it was a kind of a kind sentence, wasn't it? At that mm -hmm. moment, he allowed them to continue to live, yes. but there was a penalty for it. Yeah, th they began to die that day. The death, death process began, but they were allowed to live and live some 930-odd yeah. years right. after this. So. And so God made human beings and angelic creatures, heavenly creatures, that all had free will. Correct. Yeah. All and right. chose poorly.
Yes, they did. Scarlett, thank you so much for your phone call yeah, today question. on yeah, Pastor's Perspective. I'm Brian Perez here with Don Stewart and Bill Welsh answering your Bible questions at 888-564-6173. We'll go to Edwin in Downey now. Hello, Edwin. Hey, hello, Pastor. How are you today? Hi, Edwin. Good. Good. Hey. Hey, so I have a question about the baptism with the Holy Spirit when does occur in the life of the Christians at the beginning when they believe or uh, after that. So that's my question. All right, Bill. Great question and a, a controversial question too. <laughs> yeah. There, we had in in the conference we just had. I, I there was one moment that I thought was just it was so gracious, um, and the the speaker was talking about the difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. That some would say were would use different terminology. Some would say baptized by the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Are, are different experiences, are different events in a person's life. Baptism is important. To begin with, um, water baptism, I think you should be baptized the next opportunity you have to be baptized once you've believed. I believe also the Scripture makes it very clear that when we believe, we are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Every time we use the word baptism, we're not talking about water, are we, Don? No, not at all. It's a, it's a multi-purpose word that just basically means to submerge, like it's an all-in sort of a, uh, a connotation. So when a person believes, the Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit sort of ushers them all the way into the body of Christ. They become a part of the family of God right at that moment, not halfway. They don't need to go through catechism to get there. When you believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you confess him as, as your, your Lord, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 that at that time you are saved. And uh, the second question, I think, which is what you're talking about, Edmund, um, or the, the, the next baptism, I should say, is the filling of the Holy Spirit. When should a Christian ask God to fill them with the Holy Spirit? And I think, I, I'll tell you what, brother, I do that many, many times throughout a week. I say, God, fill me with your spirit as I walk into this ministry opportunity, as I'm going to the pulpit to preach the word of God, as I'm going into a hospital to visit a sick person. Just, Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. The difference is, the dynamic difference, Edwin, is this, that one function or one work of the Holy Spirit, like I said, is to bring us into the family of God. And by the way, before that, he's drawing us to that, um, that point of faith. The Holy Spirit's with us, drawing us to the, the point of conversion. When we say yes to Jesus, he ushers us into the family of God. And then the next work that the Holy Spirit, I think, continually does is to empower us for ministry. And I just encourage you, Edwin, uh, if, if you haven't done this or if you have... Uh, maybe friends that are asking the question, just tell them simply, ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Ask for the power of the Spirit to impact other people's lives and to declare His Word. I hope I, hope I didn't muddy the water on that question for you with too many words. Does that make uh, sense? Uh, thank you very much, Pastor. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for calling us today on Pastor's Perspective. 888-564-6173. Richard in Escondido has a question about angels. Hello, Richard. Hello, sirs. God bless you all, and thank you very much for your program. I love it very much. Um, I have a question because it says in the Bible, uh, angel of the Lord, and a lot of people say the angel of the Lord is supposed to be God's angel that comes here. And if we're all supposed to be uh, like Jesus when we get to heaven, isn't that mean that we're going to be like angels also because of that statement? All right, Don, what would uh, you say? No, we're not going to be like angels. Angels are a different order of being than human beings. Angels are were created beings. Uh, Hebrews 1, 7, and 14, they're made to do the service of God for those who are the heirs of salvation, ministering spirits. They have no physical or corporeal form. They're deathless, sexless creatures. There was a limited number of them. Uh, the Bible says they're part of God's, you know, creative um, repertoire, which he did. That Again, the, the, uh, what, uh, the angel, the me- not the angel, the spiritual being that became the devil, he was a cherub, which is a higher order of uh, angelic means. The seraphim, cherubim, we're told about in, in the Bible. 
And so uh, angels were the messenger ones that God created. We're not going to become that. We're going to become actually higher than the angels in authority, uh, even though we were made lower than the angels as human beings because of the faith we place in Christ. And yes, there will be angels in heaven, but again, they're in a world we cannot see right now, the unseen realm. We only see it by faith. Someday we will see it, you know, when we're there. But we only know these things by faith, and we trust God because he tells us they're there. So that's how we know they're there. All right. Richard, thank you so much for your phone call today on Pastor's Perspective. Let's go to Ron in Bedford, Virginia. Hello, Ron. Thanks for calling. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'll get you on Bluetooth. Let me turn that off so I can hear you better. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better. What's your question? Um, can someone lose their faith asking for a friend? Okay. Bill? Well, that's very interesting the way it's worded there, Ron. It's a great question. Um, I believe I believe anybody can lose their faith. I, I think you can you can fall in into doubt. You could your faith can grow weak without exercising it. People have said uh, I've heard many preachers say that faith is like a muscle. You got to exercise it, and through exercising any muscle, it grows stronger. And and that's a, probably a workable analogy. But I I think our faith can grow weak. Um, but if the, if the question is, can a believer lose their salvation? I would say absolutely not. A believer cannot lose their salvation because they're believing in Jesus Christ, and they're they're resting in him. They're they're trusting in him. Um, I you know I, there there is a um, a category that the scripture talks about um, about the the apostate. Those that have come to a place, uh, and uh, apostate basically means no faith, right, Don? It, doesn't the word itself mean that, to uh, fall back to a place? Something that, like that. That's yeah. close enough, yeah. But you know what? We, we started out with a few questions today that were, well, you know, those fall in the category of mystery, and we're going to some of the tougher questions we always get asked, aren't we? Mm -hmm. That can a Christian um, lose their salvation? Let me, let me say this as well, and then I'm going to pass it to Don. I, I don't believe a Christian can lose their salvation. What I wonder about is, can a Christian leave their salvation? Can, what about the person, and we've all known people like this, that appeared to be, and I think there's a strong emphasis on that word appeared, that appear to have been saved, and then they come to a place where I reject everything I believed, I think it was a fairy tale, of course they're wrong about that. And, and here's my response to that person, Ron, if that's maybe where your friend is or anybody that's listening. What I would do with a person that's in that position that appears to be an unbeliever, I will approach them again with the gospel, open up a conversation, and, and just talk with them through their doubts or maybe some, sometimes it's even just their anger with Christians. I don't want to be a Christian because I don't like the Christians I met. But I'll, I will approach them again with evangelism. I approach them again with a, a discussion on what Christ has done for them. And I've seen people that appear to have walked away, some would say fallen away, that have walked right back and said, yes, Jesus, take what's left of my life. And begin there again. Don, what would you say on that? Um, well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the problem is that when a person becomes a Christian, they change on the inside. You know, we don't sprout wings or a halo above our head or have a harp, you know, placed in our arms um, when we believe in Jesus. Uh, it's a change from the inside, and God knows who his are, and he's going to be the one that separates the wheat from the chaff, the sheep from the goats and that. And so we can tell a person they believed in Jesus, they have eternal life, and eternal life means exactly that. But have they, have they trusted him? And that's something... Uh, they and God have to deal with. We weren't there. We don't know. People can profess faith, and we don't know what they really mean by that, if, if they really were, um, you know, sincere. And so um, so it's if a person believes in the Lord and, and trusts Him and asks for forgiveness, and they're born again, and then you're a believer. Now, you can have doubts. You can fall away, this and that, but you're still a believer, you know, if you, if you have believed. Uh, but again, the one who's going to separate that someday is the Lord. That's not our job, our call. We're here to preach the gospel. But if a person like Bill says, uh, uh, treats us like, well, I don't believe anymore, I will, I'll, you know, I'll kind of start over with and give them the gospel again, that maybe they, they had a wrong idea of what a Christian was. And you, you, know, you don't know. Everyone's different. But that's something the Lord, uh, you know, has mm -hmm. to uh, yeah. put out. Yeah. I mean, there's, there are, are well-known, famous names down through, through history that um, – publicly and and even some proudly um abandon their faith yeah, oh, yeah. We, you know pastors always you know tell stories about templeton i think his name charles, was. Templeton. charles templeton comes to mind mm -hmm. but for every famous person there's probably you mm -hmm. know thousands of others that 
um, maybe like with your friend, and Ron, I don't know, is your, are you talking about a friend who is, is wrestling with their, the question of their own salvation at this point? I, I would say yes, more of a wrestle with their, mm-hmm. with their salvation. It's not a matter of rejecting, it's a matter yeah. of giving up because of uh, yeah. giving in and, and not being yeah. able to conquer temptations. And- well, Ron, go back to him <laughs> and just share the gospel with him. You know, we're all wrestling with temptation. Yeah, that's, that's a fight we're always going to fight. Tell him to Sorry. lean on Jesus, yeah. <laughs> Amen. Pastor's Perspective continues in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back. Pastor's Perspective continues with your question to one 564 6173 And now here again is your host, Brian Perez. All right, we are back with more of your questions on the Bible or the Christian faith. 888 564 6173 is the number to call. And a reminder that we will be here for another 90 minutes today, 5 p.m. Pacific time. We will, uh, of course, we're doing this program live right now. But the next program, we will record and play back at a later date. I'm here with author and apologist Don Stewart of EducatingOurWorld.com, where you can pick up his latest book, Living the Christian Life. And sitting in for Pastor Brian Broderson today is Bill Welsh, pastor of Refuge Calvary Chapel in Huntington Beach here in Southern California. Phone number again, 888-564-6173 here on Pastor's Perspective, which is sponsored by California Baptist University Online and Professional Studies, CBU Online, Live Your Purpose. We were speaking with uh, Ron and uh, Virginia before the uh, break, and you wanted to add something. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Ron, I hope you're still listening, and I'm thankful that your friend has a friend like you. Um, They can speak into his life, and if this issue is... You know, like you said, as we were closing the call, that he's wrestling with temptation. Oh, my goodness. Is there anybody at one of these mics that's not wrestling with <laughs> temptation right. of some kind? But uh, I'm thankful that he's got you in his life. And I, if I was you, um, Ron, I would want to sit down with my friend and, and just I- encourage him and, and maybe suggest ways that he can begin to strengthen his faith with a personal time of of uh, Bible study and devotionally reading the Word of God and keeping a journal and writing down questions, that, that kind of thing where he can stay in relationship with you and other Christians and talk through and work through his, his questions. And, and that, that's part of what a program like this is, is all about. It's, uh, in one sense, it's another version of the Christian friend that's right beside you, that as you're walking through life, you have someone you can turn to and say, man, I'm really having a hard time with resisting temptation here or there, and I'm not understanding this as I read it 
in the Bible. So you are strategically placed in his life, Ron. So um, if, if that's the case, just give him a call today and, and you know, offer to meet with him and, and to encourage him. And if, if, it's, if somebody's listening that's wrestling with their faith, ask those questions. Get in tighter in the family of God, mm-hmm. and, uh, and you'll grow. You'll grow. Amen. 888-564-6173. Uh, let's go to Terry in Garden Grove. Hello, Terry. Welcome to Pastor's Perspective. Hi there. Hello. How are you guys doing today? Doing uh, well. How are you? Okay, yeah. Um, I've been dealing with a lifelong besetting sin. Uh, I've been, I got born again in my early 20s, and and everything was good for a number of years. God blessed me with a wonderful wife and kids. Um, however, through the years of that, I had slipped into uh, basically being a carnal Christian. And about a year ago or so, uh, God got my attention. And basically at this point in my life, I'm in Babylon. I, You know, God has used his holy two-by-four, if you will, and, you know, is, is he's got my attention. Okay. So... Through this year, I've been really honestly trying to do everything from a biblical point of view. Yeah, so your question here is about, should you take a Nazarite vow? Yeah, yeah. So my my question is, is, I mean, I'm I'm fasting and praying. Do you you think that God would honor um, my efforts if I were to incorporate a, a Nazarite vow. All right. First of all, Don, what is a Nazarite, Nazarite vow? Is when we find the Old Testament, it was something uh, directed to the nation of Israel. And, uh, you know, it was, it's not something for New Testament believers. You know, Samson was a Nazarite. He didn't uh, drink uh, a strong drink. And, uh, you know, uh, there's other things equated with it. But no, no, that's, uh, Terry, that's not the answer of taking some vow to, you know, um, because what happens is usually when we make a vow, we last about three or four days, but then we fall on our face. We have to realize that, you know, uh, every day we, we're fighting a battle. This is back on the last question. It, you know, life is tough. Spiritual life isn't easy. It's a battle going on. And there's not a, a panacea, a cure-all for that. Now, Bill, as a pastor, you get all kinds of people coming to you, asking you questions in very similar situations yeah. like Terry said. And it's not like you, there's not a magic bullet. Is there one particular answer? Because it's a lifelong thing you have to deal with. It's not like, well, if I make this vow or I say this or I do this thing, then it's all going to go away. It's not, is it? No, it, it doesn't. And I, I find myself uh, um, it, with questions like this, whether they're, you know, from a caller here on the radio or another friend or myself that the the path I need to take is to Romans 6 Mm -hmm. and reckon the old man to be dead indeed unto sin. I have to I have to look at the opportunity uh, uh, of whatever the temptation is, the opportunity to sin and and live as if I was dead to that temptation. And it's it's a it's a lifelong in many and, and obviously, too, uh, and all of us could give our own details on this. There are things that every one of us has to say no to for the mm-hmm. rest of our lives. Exactly. There are there are temptations I used to have before I came to Christ that were gone in, in a heartbeat when I came to Christ, but there were some that were not. And and with those temptations, I had to make the decision: I want to honor God, I want to love God, I, I want to live a clean life, and I will walk away from that. And some of those things uh, I can't remember which caller we were at Terry. In, in Garden Grove, um, Terry, there were some of those that that I, I wrestled with for many, many years mm-hmm. and, and sometimes agonized over, felt like, oh, God can't love me today because I lusted or God can't mm-hmm. love me because I was dishonest or something. And it was a conviction that comes upon me. Not s- God's not just trying to make us feel guilty or shamed. It's a conviction that presses us in the right direction. It pushes us away from the sin. In fact, the, the word that's used uh, for resisting sin or resisting the devil means to push back in the opposite direction. 
If he's pushing me to hate, I want to push back in the opposite direction to love. It just really comes down to a daily decision, doesn't it? Yeah, and remember this too, Terry. Uh, Satan is the one that condemns us. The Lord disciplines us to, and disciplines us to get us on the straight and narrow. Satan, you know, whispers in the air, look, you're no good. You're, God will never love you. That's not God speaking. That's, that's the enemy speaking. And so we all, everybody has things they wrestle with. I had one professor once talking about uh, the spiritual life is kind of like going once around a mountain. You start at the bottom, you go once, you know, it's going around the mountain to get to the top, and you meet these problems on the way, and a lot of people choose to ignore it, and they, what happened? They go once around the mountain, and there it is again, and so what are you going to deal with it? Nope, and they, a lot of people keep going around in circles, as it were, but here's the thing. If you deal with it, you're going to go up a little ways. There's going to be another issue to deal with. There's always going to be something in this life. We're never going to reach perfection, and that's something we have to understand. Uh, I think we th- uh, think too much of ourselves that we're going to make it. We're never going to fall. First Corinthians 10, 12 is a good verse all of us need to have on the refrigerator. But anybody thinks they st- t- stand, better take heed lest they fall, because we're we're not as good as we think we are. Any of us can commit any sin at any time. It's still in our own human fa- fallen heart, and we have to appreciate that. Mm-hmm. That's why we have to let the Holy Spirit guide us constantly. On that subject, I was telling my wife this the other day, and I've told this before. I had a professor once when I was going to Bible college, a class in Romans in the afternoon. It wasn't the most interesting class I ever had, but he said something one day. It, it woke me up, actually. Uh, it was boring. <laughs> Unfortunately, I made Romans boring, which I didn't appreciate. But he said this. He said, no matter <laughs> who we are, where we are with Christ, any of us uh, any of us are capable of any type of sin. And I thought, wait a minute. And then I thought, mm, well, actually, he's right, isn't he? Because isn't it true, Bill, given the wrong circumstances, any of us could be guilty of anything? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it was a, an old Roman statesman. It might have been McShane who said, yeah. the seed of every sin lies within me. Yeah. And exactly. I, I had the same response yep. that you do when I first said, wait a minute, I can give you a list of 10 things that I, I would n- never do. And then, well, but on it, second yeah, thought, it, maybe. It, yeah, one or two the, wrong steps in the wrong direction. Exactly. Given the wrong circumstances, yeah. anything's possible. Yeah. That's why we have to guard ourselves in that. I, so. I want to throw this in here, too, that, you know, in First John, uh, John, he gives a couple of reasons why he's writing, but he says, I write these things to you so that you don't sin. But if you sin, mm-hmm. you have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. And then he says in 1 John 3, 20, and, and you were talking about this too, Don, uh, from 1 Corinthians, but sorry, it connects with that verse. But for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And uh, my, there's something about my heart. I call myself names all the time, and mm-hmm. my wife says, stop calling yourself idiot or stop calling yourself stupid. And um, but if my heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart. He's not. Yep. He, he's he's not against me. He's for me. Exactly. And so, you know, Terry, you just need to know that with whatever you're wrestling with, God is for you in this battle mm-hmm. and he wants you to win. He wants you to stand. And so, Father, I just want to pray for my brother, Terry, whatever this is. Father, we're all in the battle and we're in this battle together. And I just pray that you would grant him those victories every day as he just as he just surrenders to your will, Father. I just pray that you would you would conquer whatever this might be and your spirit within him would strengthen him to stand, Father God. And I pray for anybody else that's listening, wrestling with sins of any kind, Father. Let them know of your great love for them and your power towards them and help us to stand, Father, in purity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Terry, thanks for calling us today on Pastor's Perspective. I'm Brian Perez here with author and apologist Don Stewart of EducatingOurWorld.com and Bill Welsh, pastor of Refuge Calvary Chapel in Huntington Beach, California. We're taking your phone calls on the Bible or the Christian faith at 888-564-6173. We are live for another 15 minutes or so, and uh, then we'll take a quick break, and then we'll we'll record a uh, program uh, that will air at a later date, so you're able to call us until 5 p.m. today. I see right now the lines are full. There's probably people trying to get through. Uh, you have until 5 p.m. Pacific time today to give us a call, 888-564-6173. Let's go to Florida, speak with Shamar. Hello, Shamar. Hello. Thank you guys so much for taking my call. I love listening to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so um, before, um, a couple of days ago, I used to have the understanding that, you know, when you die... You have no memory. That's it. And um, the the living has no communication at all with the dead. But the other day, I was I was reading in Samuel, the book of Samuel, and Saul went to like a spiritist, and the spiritist raised up dead Samuel. And I'm like, oh, maybe I misunderstood something. 
Um, can you guys shed some light on that? All right, Don. <clears throat> yeah, good question there. First of all, the Spiritists didn't do this, uh, uh, Shamar. It was the Lord that did this. Uh, the, the, the medium there was probably a, um, a hoax, a phony, but whatever the case may be, uh, it was Samuel that showed up. Uh, and Samuel basically was there to pronounce judgment on um, Saul. Five times in the account it said it was Samuel, so we believe it was literally him, and Saul did die the next day as Samuel told him. And so um, when you're asked about remember our life on earth, now this is a whole different question. Um, when we get to heaven, it's not like we're going to not have any knowledge of here on earth. We're, you know, we're going to know even as we are known, and so we're going to be smarter than we are. I like what uh, J. Bernard McGee always tells the story of the late G. Campbell Morgan, one of the greatest preachers the world's ever seen. After a church service, one woman asked uh, Pastor Morgan, Dr. Morgan, will we know our loved ones in heaven? And he said, ma'am, I don't expect to be a bigger fool in heaven than I am here on the earth, and I certainly know who my loved ones are here on the earth. And so we're going to know things. We're going to know even more. But probably we're going to have an understanding of why we're there, why certain people may not be there. We're going to have a, a whole different mindset on that. Now, some people think we won't have any memory of the, of the unbelievers at all, like they never existed. That's one possibility. There's the other possibility. We have God's viewpoint on that and understand why we're here and they're not. It's something we don't know. Either one will work. I'm curious, Bill, your thoughts on that. I'm, I've, got, I've got the same questions and the same conclusions. I know our Good. sins and iniquities will be remembered no more. Yeah. I think we'll, I think those will be you know are yeah. obviously uh, w would say put in the chipper. Or yes, exactly. Chipper. Like that. It's yeah. all gone. Yeah. All right, Shamar, does that help? Yeah. So I guess the the, the answer to the the question about the the spirit is like it's it's not that the the, the medium. Um, no, did not do that. No, no, no the medium started. was shocked. Okay. Remember the story, medium. What what's going on here? You know, medium wasn't expecting that to happen because gotcha, by definition, gotcha. yeah, she's probably a fraud. Which is the case every time something like that happens in exactly. a seance. Yeah. It's, yeah, exactly. it's uh, demons yeah. masquerading mm -hmm. as the loved one. Yeah, either demons or someone's pulling a fast one yeah, on the right. people yeah. there. Those, those are the two options. Yeah. All right, Shamar, thanks for calling us from Florida with your question here on Pastor's Perspective, 888-564-6173. Uh, let's go to Natalie in Riverside who has a question. Uh, is it okay to listen to worship music from churches that are maybe a little <laughs> off on their theology without naming the names of the churches? Uh, right, Natalie, that's your question basically? Yes, it is. All right. I'm hearing that a lot of it is um, behind the, the NAR movement, and I'm just yeah. wondering if, we sing them in our church. I don't know if I can give my the name of my church, but we sing these songs. But I just, I, Be, I have you, friends that are uh, posting about it. I just want to pass this. I'm sorry, Natalie. There. What behind the what movement? New Apostolic the, Reformation. The new, the okay. new Apostolic yeah, that's Reformation. Not, oh, okay. Yeah. In other is, words, is the theology of the NAR showing up in? Oh yeah, the that's, that's song? wacky. It's all get out. Oh yes. In, is it showing up in the in the lyrics of the songs? Oh yes. Wow. Not all of them, but some of them. Well, let me say this, and then I'll let uh, Don weigh in. I didn't mean to jump in there. No, it's but I, I tend to be as intense as I think Pastor Chuck was. Chuck Smith, for those of you that don't remember, Pastor Chuck that uh, was the pastor here at Calvary Costa Mesa. Um, I tend to be a, almost as intense on this issue that we're... I want to make sure that the songs we're singing in our congregation are biblically sound. I found out uh, about a, a church in... Um, in Sydney uh, called, um, it's an Anglican church, but the youth movement is called City Alight, and they're writing a lot of new songs, and they said their, their mission is to write songs that are, are compelling melodies, easy to sing, which I really love, and that are biblical. And then when I heard it, I thought, oh my goodness, what a concept <laughs> to actually sing truth in, in church. And I'm not saying that that uh, the opposite is true in most churches. But I'm a little intense on making sure that we're singing what's true. So I'm just going to throw it out here. The, one of the most popular songs uh -oh, going goes. around today He's going is there. Oh, no. The Reckless Love of God. And when that started to become popular, I remember the first time I sang and I thought, Reckless, did we sing Reckless? And I looked up and it was Reckless and I thought... I remember this line in a movie. I do not think that means what you think it means. <laughs> reckless <laughs> means to do something that is reckless. You know, you're not thinking about the consequences, and there's nothing about God that is reckless, though it might appear that way. So is it? do you, do you give the writer poetic license or not? I have jokingly said we could just change the spelling of reckless from the R and put the W at the beginning of it, and it would make sense to me because God's love cannot be wrecked. But anyway, I'm intense about us singing... Um, accurate lyrics, biblically accurate lyrics. Um, 
Is it wrong to sing, um, you know, to, to listen to bands like Hillsong and Bethel Music? I haven't heard much in their music that has given me concern. Um, I, I don't know about you, Don, but... Uh, well, here's the thing. Um, there, there's a mindset there that comes from a percep- perception that they may say similar words that we would use, but sometimes the meaning is something different according to their theology uh, because they're, um, you've got to be very careful uh, with the words. Now, the good news is if we're singing it from, uh, you know, from a heart that knows the Scripture, knows the Lord, then it's no problem at all, even if maybe someone has some uh, different ideas that the word might mean something different to them than us, and and some circumstance we don't want to get this and get in the weeds here, but you know, they have these technical meanings for some of the words that most people don't have, mm-hmm. but it means something different to them, and most people that sing it wouldn't even begin to comprehend yeah. uh, this. So, uh, yeah. And by the way, you didn't get the whole context there, Phil. You you, you forgot to say you. you keep using that word. <laughs> yes, yeah, I that's, that's, yeah, that's I, right. I don't think that's it means right. what you think You're it right. means. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> okay. Anyway. Now, wasn't there a church years ago also? So this has kind of always happened, where the theology was starting to veer off in a different direction, oh, yeah. but the music was still yeah. you yes, know, yes. spot on. And, and, you know, just to identify it, the, the, the problem with the theology, in uh, and, and it's a different issue in, in Hillsong than it is in, uh, mm-hmm. in Bethel. Exactly. Um, with Hillsong, it definitely is some prosperity uh-huh. teaching that um, God always wants you to be wealthy or healthy or whatever, but it's... It's it's almost sometimes like a um, uh, oh, a self improvement, yeah. you know, kind of a message, and not always, not always. Uh, but and I think God has done some uh, some great things through uh, through that movement as well. People have come to Christ mm-hmm. through that. I, a, a friend told me years ago that God will use anything as much as He can. Mm-hmm. But um, I I've, I remember um, that one of the th- streams that you were talking about back in the 70s, and it was coming out of the heart of the, the what Chuck called or what we used to call the name it and claim it, mm-hmm. you know, theology. But there was beautiful music coming out of that, yes. and I never heard anything in the in the lyrics mm-hmm. and the the music that even had a shade of uh, of you know false ideas about doctrine and God in it. Maybe, maybe I didn't hear all the songs. Yeah, you know where you really can't go wrong is just sing scripture, and then unless you're quoting the devil, of course, yeah, what he right. says. But you know if you sing you know the Psalms with the you know that, and but mm-hmm. even then you've got to be careful. You know, yeah. uh, even then because the context that's there. But if you use you know words that come out of the lips of the Lord Jesus or one of His apostles or God mm-hmm. speaking the truth of God, you're in pretty good shape there. And that's a lot of what we did here at Calvary Chapel exactly. back in the early days. Totally. We sang the word of God. And it wasn't always just word for word, but it was a psalm exactly. that was, you know, mm-hmm. the lyrics were, it was just basically straight from Scripture. And so, it's a great way to memorize Scripture, too. Yeah, absolutely. By is. singing the song. So I would just appeal to to worship leaders, you know, you have such an incredible mm-hmm. opportunity to help us get the word of God embedded in our hearts. So you singers and songwriters out there that are writing yeah. new worship songs, Keep it biblical because mm-hmm. <laughs> this is one of the most sobering things to speakers, Don, isn't it? Yeah, that I sure is. That um, the people that, that sit in our, our fellowships and sing our songs and then listen to our messages, they will remember the songs long after they've mm-hmm. forgotten the messages. Yep. So make sure those songs are just filled with truth. Indeed. All right, Natalie, thank you for calling us today on Pastor's Perspective. I'm Brian Perez here with author and apologist Don Stewart of EducatingOurWorld.com and Bill Welsh. Refuge, Refuge Calvary Chapel in Huntington Beach, Pastor. And we're here until 4 p.m. today to answer your questions on the Bible or the Christian faith. I take that back. We are here until 5 p.m. today, Pacific Time, to answer your questions on the Bible or the Christian faith. We'll be taking a quick break in just a few minutes, and then we'll record a full hour of your questions and play them back at mm-hmm. a later date. All right, let's go to Jeremy in Murrieta. Hello, Jeremy. Hello. Is it snowing well, where you I are? Quick... What's that? Never mind. Go ahead. What's your question? <laughs> Okay, um, my son is going to my ex-wife's house, and I'm trying to find out what religion she's trying to teach him now. Um, he says that she's making him pray over the Torah, and they're telling him that Jesus is a fake uh, Christ, and that um, they're praying to some other god. All right, how old is your son? He's eight years old. All right, Don, what do you know? And he's on fire for Jesus Christ. Oh, good. We keep praying that. Yeah, Jeremy, this is um, a variety of possibilities there. 
there, there are missionaries out there who are, are anti-Christian missionaries who, who work among the Jewish people, and they say, you know, Jesus is the false Messiah, Jesus isn't the Christ, uh, the Torah, uh, that's the law, the law of Moses, the first five books, usually it's refers to that. That's a generic, general way of saying it. That's what you go to. Uh, the truth is is there. You don't want to go, you know, anything beyond that. The Christians have perverted it, this and that. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the trouble is if you, you read the first five books, you don't get very much out of it, which these people seem to get out of it. That's not the message you get at all when you read it in context. And again, if the Torah is incomplete. You need more. You need, you know, in fact, the book of Joshua has probably been added to the, you know, Deuteronomy and Joshua sort of come together, as it were, there. Uh, but you need the whole message of the, not only the Old Testament, but the Old Testament's incomplete. It ends with, you know, uh, the Lord, uh, Elijah's going to come and hit the earth with a curse. There's, where's the hope? Well, the hope came, you know, 400 years later when Zacharias, the, uh, the man at the temple, was there worshiping, and the angel Gabriel appeared to him and told him about a son that's going to be born to him would be the forerunner of the Messiah. And that's, that's the hopeful message. So you need both testaments. Uh, the Torah, the law is great. It's perfect. You know, the first five books, it, it's the foundation. But it doesn't end there. That's the whole problem, isn't it, Bill? Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, Jeremy, thanks for your phone call today on Pastor's Perspective. Let's go to Daniel in Ontario. We've only got about a minute or so, Daniel, so uh, make it quick. Okay, uh, quick question. Uh, I've heard a voice, a woman's voice, since I was a young child. Every so often throughout the years, I'll hear my name said, uh, called out, but I don't know where, um, you know, I never saw anything until uh, when I was in my 20s. Uh, it was late at night. I heard someone call my name. The exact, exact same woman's voice. It sounds like it's right behind me, but all over. I walk out. I turn around, and I see this thing flash by right down my hall, and it's transparent except for the very middle part. If you can imagine, like um, like a swoosh with an image. Okay. No feet. Blonde hair, long curly. Um, and I heard her. The last time I heard her voice was right after my grandmother died. Okay. Yeah, just really, you know. Anyway, so I was just curious, uh, and I and I don't go to church, but rarely, ever, I rarely go to church. I stumbled across your radio station, and I thought, you know what? Why not ask you? You, I, I like hearing what you had to say. I've listened for about thirty minutes now, straight, and I enjoy your show. But I thought that you would be somebody who might be. Uh, able to give you an answer that I could think on. All right, Bill. Daniel, l let me just ask you a question. Have Have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Have you thanked Him for dying for your sins on the cross and and uh, and put your faith in Him as your Savior? Have you done that? You know, I think at one time uh -huh. I did. I think well, I. Um, <laughs> but but you haven't really I, I, grown in that faith, have you? You know, I haven't. I, okay. I've. Um, I haven't in a, in a sense that I've stepped into different yeah. um Well, Daniel, churches. we're going to we're going to ask you to stay on the line. I would love to talk with you afterwards, but it sounds like there's a confusing voice, spirit or something that's trying to draw you away from what you need more than anything and that's calling out on Jesus Christ. This doesn't sound like this voice is leading you to Christ or that would have been accomplished by now. So hang on the line and would love to talk with you and for everybody that's listening um, if you have similar issues, if you're wandering around looking for the right voice, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. His voice is embedded in the Word of God. Read the Gospel. All right. Uh, everybody on hold, stay on hold. We will be right with you. Hang on. Thanks for listening to Pastor's Perspective. We trust you've been blessed and had your question answered. Join us Monday through Friday and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash pastorsperspective. The preceding was sponsored by Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, California.